we're live. Welcome, everybody, to uh, regular scheduled programming, you could say. We uh, have been doing a lot of open shows, so this one is just a pre-quarterfinal show, which we'll probably be touching a little bit on each week, but this one, uh, this topic today will be good for anyone who's competing, whether it's in the quarterfinals or whether it's later, you can still apply the, uh, the principles in this, uh, this topic to it. So, um, even if you're not doing quarterfinals or you're not coaching anyone in quarterfinals, you can still learn a lot from this. So we hope that, uh, you can stay tuned, have some good questions for us, but, um, as a whole, we're going to tr- kind of focus it on quarterfinals, maybe a little bit on semifinals as well and general competition, just so you can have some context and see it, uh, in real life and, how we would kind of uh, structure some things, but we are talking about simulations, training simulations, why they're important, how they can help you, um, how how to do them, because maybe you'll do one, uh, maybe your coach or uh, whatever training group you're working with is doing them, uh, but we'll, we'll talk about how to approach them, why they're important, and so on. So if you have any questions on the way, you can ask. If you're listening, you can uh, shoot us some some messages if you have anything about that. But uh, yeah, talking about simulations. What is a simulation? Sam, you want to you want to kick it off for us? Tell us uh, sure. what you think a simulation is. Yeah, yeah. I the I did a I don't know, it was like a webinar or something last year and it was it was on simulations and the word I wrote down to kind of describe a simulation was a scrimmage. Cause that made sense from a more traditional sport background, you know, as a kid, soccer, basketball, you would have simulation or scrimmages, uh, before the game. Uh, and then even golf, you'd have a practice round, which is essentially the same thing. It's like, uh, mm-hmm. a run through before the real thing. And so in this sport, you, you need something like that as well. And so simulations act as that, where you get to practice, an iteration of the competition, the thing you're going to have to do, which has a multitude of benefits that are going to serve you well on game day. But that's essentially what the simulation, the idea is, is a, a practice of what you're going to have to do on game day, usually beforehand, quite a bit beforehand to give your system some time to rest. And then the structuring is going to mimic what you're probably going to have to do for competition. I, I don't know how in depth you want to get right away um, on those elements, but those are kind of the, the zoomed out, the zoomed out picture of what a simulation is, a scrimmage of what you're going to have to do on game day before you actually compete. Yeah. Yeah. Scrimmage is good. That's what I tell everyone. I tell scrimmage and mock meet when you're in, we're swimming or track and field, you have mock meets to, you know, especially for you. It's funny. Cause it's, a lot of the time it's for children. It's like well, to help them kind of see it and understand like, Hey, you're, you're going to be called up at this time. You have to go here. You know, if, if you haven't done your warmups or, you know, like you're, you're in the pool or you're doing your, your, your sprint prep or warming up um, to kind of help them get a, a understand it's a system and it's like a sport, but, and it's fun, but you're still trying to, you know, you have to understand that there's a method to it. In quarterfinals, it's a little different because like, you, you know, you're just given the, here's your instructions, you go. And most people are adults, so it's a, a little different, but children are in, you know, are learning and we're learning. So it's mm-hmm. kind of similar. Like you have to learn how to do this, um, which to me, it seems almost, you know, just as important as doing it for like a semifinals as a quarterfinals, because you don't have the structure. So you may, you know, you show up to quarterfinals and you have, you have so much rope that you end up, you know, hanging yourself. you like, you're, you're doing it in a, incorrectly because, you're not structured, you haven't practiced it and you don't know what to do. And then when you get there, you're like, I, wow, I didn't realize, or you don't even know that you didn't do it well because you haven't practiced it or you don't have someone telling you where your holes were. So I think it's important for everyone just to give it a go so that they can learn the experience before doing it. Other than the little things that we're probably going to talk about. Um, It's important to run. Uh Oh, what happened to Roman? Well, while wow, he's, uh, let's see, is he coming back? Well, if he doesn't, I'll keep going. Uh, one thing I was going to add was competing Competing and training are very, very different. They're different skills. They're different. They have different intentions, different goals. 
And so it's something that you, you need to be practicing so that when you do go compete, you feel very prepared and comfortable in this very uncomfortable environment, a very uncertain environment. And so if you've ever gone to a competition and whether you competed or you watched competitors, you can quickly see which people are very comfortable in that environment versus those that are not so comfortable by their preparation process, between events, cooling down, how they look on the competition floor. Not to say that, uh, I wonder if I'm going to have to add them back in. Um, hold on. I'm going to hold that thought. I got to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to send this to Roman since we lost him. That's so funny. Lost our host. Okay, good. So he's, I got him an invite. Let's see if he uh, jumps back in. Screen blacked out, short happened, trying to log back in. Okay, so he's coming. Um, so this was something I noticed the one of the first big competitions I went to with a with a an athlete is just how uncomfortable they were because it was a new environment, a new setting. It's you know, you're seeing people who are the best in the sport. It can be a little bit overwhelming. And so one of the ways you can improve that anxiety is of course by competing more and being there more often, but also in your lead up to train it lead up to competing in your actual training. So if I am able to put myself in situations in the gym where I'm trying to replicate what I'm going to have to do on game day, that can make me feel a little bit more, a little bit more comfortable when I get there, how I warm up, what it feels like to wait in the corrals for 10 minutes before I have to do an event, how I cool down, what I'm going to eat between uh, events to make sure I don't feel too full or I, don't, I feel too tired between events how I'm going to cool down after the day's done, what I'm going to eat before I go to bed, et cetera. So we, we implement this idea in training when we start to get to levels of the competition that are going to be multi-day, multi-event stages of the competition. Because with the open, it's one event. You don't necessarily need as structured of a simulation. What you can do, which I'm sure a lot of people did, is you might once a week do a more challenging workout or a, pa a past open workout. So maybe on a Wednesday you did a, a former, um, oh, here's Roman. He's back. Uh, maybe you did add to stage. Maybe you did a former open workout on a Wednesday and that acted as a, pr as a practice to preparing for the open, but that's probably the extent of what you needed. Whereas now with the quarterfinals, you have five to six events. You have a multiple days in a row. You have to do multiple events on a day. You have to film and record it. You have to have a judge. You have to have your equipment available. You need to know how much time between events you can handle. And you need to also, of course, know that within the constraints of the gym you're operating in, if it's not your own gym. So there's just a lot of variables that you have to be thinking about. And what, what does that cause? It causes a lot of mental energy. And that can drain, that can drain your available resources for your actual physical expression that you need. As we know in research, the more cognitive load you have, it drastically raises your perception of effort from the start. So if you have a lot of cognitive loading and then you have to go put out a lot of effort, you're going to hit your wall faster than somebody who doesn't have a lot of cognitive load going into it. So simulations act as a great way of managing that cognitive load so that when you go compete, you have a lot of availability of resources that you can use so that you can, of course, give your best effort. So that's in a nutshell, some of the additional pieces that we're thinking about when we, when we talk about simulations, but now Roman's back. Welcome back. Roman. I was hacked. I was hacked. I'm back. I defeated the hackers. If it happens again, I'm going to just jump on another computer. Um, Sam probably summed it up. Well, I totally agree. Um, <laughs> Yes, we I just, yeah, I, I just, I, I kind of added a little bit more color to simulations, why they're of value now, especially now that we're past the open, what are the things that we're uh, thinking about with respect to the simulations and practicing and getting ready for game day. So just kind of giving a little bit of a rundown. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah. I, I or, or just look. I was just looking at the doc. 
there's some nice bullet points around like the importance of and then the reasons for the simulations just to give people maybe yeah. some more clear examples so the first one is build confidence in the athlete before competition which might have came out in what i was talking about but that's just at at the bottom that's what it really is it's about building confidence for that uncertain environment so that's number one two practicing the format and flow ahead of time whether it's a single day multi-day competition just getting practice of the actual of what you're actually gonna have to do on game day practicing the tests if they're available so if you get the tests ahead of time this is very helpful especially for the semifinals. they usually come out a week or so beforehand and so it's a great opportunity for athletes to run through them doesn't mean you're going to go full speed but you get to maybe do half of it or you go through the whole thing but you kind of slow down your pace you just get a feel for the the event and that just helps you have a better understanding of what to expect build rhythm and routine ahead of the competition so this is actually really important and something that people overlook a lot is when are you waking up what are you eating for breakfast how much time do you have from breakfast to when you're going to warm up for your event? What are you doing for your cool down? What are you eating after that, after that event? When are you warming up for your next one? What are you eating after that event? What are you eating for dinner? That whole sequence, you look at people at the, the elite level. Like I always use Brent Fikowski as, as a great example because he's extremely dialed, but a lot of them at that level are. It's like every minute, every hour is dialed like perfectly. And what does that do? That just relieves anxiety and uncertainty around what they need to be doing. And it allows them to divert that energy to actually performing. So simulations can allow you to practice setting up, like what's the flow that's going to work best for me on game day. And then another one, uh, a sense of control over a largely uncontrollable situation. So that's kind of a, an umbrella statement for all the things I previously mentioned. We do all these things so that when we go there, we just feel a little bit more comfortable and we feel a little bit more in control, even though there's a lot of things in that environment that aren't controllable. And then you also become better at the skill of competing, which if you're a competitor, that's all you really care about is you want to be a, a better competitor. You want to compete better. You don't really like, yeah, you want to, you need to train because training is the app or the, the vehicle to get you to uh, winning or competing at a higher level. At the end of the day, what really matters is competing. Like you need to become a better competitor, and competing is a skill. And so, how do we practice that? Somehow the battery wasn't isn't charged. It's like has zero percent battery. I can hear you. <laughs> I'm gonna mute you. I think I just muted you. Um, <laughs> this is hilarious. So. Getting better at the skill of competing. Uh, that's also what we're trying to do with the simulations. So let's get into, until he comes back, let's get into like general principles around designing simulations and how we're going to lay them out. So first general principle, the length of the simulation needs to reflect the length of the competition for the most part. An example of when you might not go to the full distance would be like the games. The games having... 15 events over four days you in in my experience with the people i've prepared for the games we would do a three four day simulation before the games but it it, it wouldn't be as intensive obviously because they're not going to give the same amount of effort they will on game day but also i would moderate the volume and types of events so that they're not um they're not digging themselves too deep of a hole three weeks out from competition. So outside of that example, you would replicate what you're probably gonna have to do on game day. So we're about a month out from the quarterfinals. This is today's March 21st. The quarterfinals start April 18th, so less than a month. And next weekend, not this weekend, I have a lot of my quarterfinal athletes doing a simulation. It's gonna be the bigger simulation because it's gonna be two weeks out from competing, which in principle is a good rule of thumb. You give yourself two weeks before competition to do a tough simulation. And so they're gonna do, I, I have uh, six events designed. They'll do that over two to three days, depending upon their schedule. And so that's me trying to replicate the, the length of the simulation that is indicative of the actual competition that they're going to have to do. So that's, that would be principle number, uh, general principle number one. 
if to give an alternative example, I had a client, she did a, uh, USA functional fitness. They did a, uh, collegiate national championship, which was really cool. And they did a medley format. So it was over a two hour period. They did six events, I believe six or five events. So they do like an event every 30 minutes. And so two weeks out, we did a run through of that. So she could get an idea of what that felt like do an event, rest 15 minutes, do an event, rest 15 minutes. So we replicated what we'd have to do on game day. Okay. Quick pause because Roman left again. So unprofessional. Come on, man. This guy's the host and he's, uh, can't even, can't even get his stuff together. Doesn't matter. Don't really need him. We can go without him. Okay. So let's keep going. There needs to be good variety and variation in the tests. So one thing I was thinking about, cause I was doing this earlier today is what themes do I want inside of the tests that I'm going to, um, that I'm going to be designing. So I'm looking at past quarterfinal events. I'm looking at semifinal events and I'm trying to pull out themes. And so then inside of the themes, there are, uh, characteristics that we can then challenge. So if we look at last year, the first event had squatting and pressing the second event had uh, lunging and jumping, which is kind of a weird one. Uh, and it was more of a crossover workout anyway. So that one's kind of like a wash. The third one was like a battery type test, how I think of it in my head. And then the fourth one was, wasn't even really a row workout. It was just a core workout. So that's another wash. And then the last one was bending and pulling. So if you look at the first and the, the last event, you saw non-complementary pattern muscle endurance in the first and the last. So maybe that's a theme that they want to test test for. So we might be able to use that. You look at the last year they had, and then you, you kind of look at the themes inside of those events and then you kind of pull out, okay, I want to create a test that challenges this type of characteristic. And so that's how I'm going about thinking on what's the structure of the competition. So what I did earlier this morning is I wanted a longer endurance event that was mainly cyclical. I wanted a lifting event. I wanted a power event that was shorter, less than seven minutes, six minutes power in the CrossFit sense. I wanted two weightlifting and gymnastic type events. And then I wanted a, uh, a gymnastic event that was like th a triplet, three different types of gymnastics. So those are my six events. So those are themes. And so then I can use that as my blueprint for what I'm going to create for the simulation. And so with, whatever the competition is, you can look at past years to try to get an idea of what they might be thinking about from a theme perspective so that you can then design a simulation that will hopefully give the athlete an idea of what to expect when they do compete on actual game day. So length of simulation needs to reflect the length of competition. Structure needs to reflect the, the structure of the competition ideally. Good variety in the tests and variations, which again comes back to what are we what are we anticipating? And then this was actually I didn't mention this need opportunities for the athlete to succeed and potentially fail. So, assuming training has been going well and people are prepared, simulations act as a great opportunity for athletes to gain confidence in their ability and where they're currently at by testing themselves a little bit and actually competing. Uh, and also the possibility to push themselves a little bit and see where the line is. So when I, when I mentioned possibly failing potential to fail, that can be a good thing because it, it gives them the opportunity to kind of push it a little bit and get a better sense of where's my threshold at. So that when I do go in or so on game day, I have a better sense of, of kind of where I'm at. So these are very general principles for simulations in the designing of them. I'm back. You're back now? Back on the iPhone. There's no way it can fail now. Man. How embarrassing. I know. And then Camille, shit, my, my wife shouts from the living room, they can still hear you. <laughs> I was like, well, they can hear you too then. 
No, I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't hear her. I heard you though, but okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> I am sending. Okay, you so the, what are you sending me? The the simulation weekend example. If we ever get to pull it up, just in case, because I don't. I don't okay. My phone. But yeah. Where are we at? All right. Okay, so we talked about general principles. We talked about the the reasons for them. Okay. Yeah. And then you went over we, the structure of, course, of a potential semifinal. Uh no, I didn't I didn't I didn't go over structure yet. So we can talk about I was I was well, talking said, about you said event one, two, events. three. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that I was I was I was creating for uh my clients because mm -hmm. this morning I was working on a the simulation for next weekend for quarterfinals. So this, the structure we have on this document here, which is a really general template for regionals and semifinals you have, if you've looked over mainly regionals, if you looked at like 2012 to 2018, you had like this very general, theme of the type of characteristics and the type of tests and how they would lay them out. And it was close this past year. So it's, it's, it's still in play. Usually event one is something long, more capacity oriented. Then usually there's something lifting based. That's day one, day two, more of a skill test. Then in the afternoon, more of a power test. Day three starts with more of a chipper extended muscle endurance type test. And then finally something short and fast. That's a very consistent theme you see. And so as a, as a bare minimum, you would want people to be fairly competent, capable at something like that. Can they do six events over three days with those different types of categories? That's a good reference point for a competitive CrossFitter. Can I do these types of events over three days, give really good efforts and have great performance across all six events? So now, of course, things have moved a little bit. Like this past year in the quarterfinals, event four was the battery strength battery type test, which we could classify as like the lifting test. And so that was after doing, you know, three was it three events? Uh, it would sorry, this is it was the third. It was the first was the the squatting and the handstand push up muscle up. Then the second was the AMRAP with uh, the lunges and crossovers, and then the third was the clean and jerk and burpee box jump over. So they pushed it back quite a bit uh, instead of it being earlier in the competition. And then same at the semifinals, the, the max snatch was on day two. And that was the, that was the afternoon. That was the afternoon event. Linda was in the morning. So, so you do need to be good at lifting in the presence of fatigue. So you don't want to always front load the lifting event. You do want to challenge people in, in their ability to hit near their maximums with some fatigue present. So that would be general outline of a multi-day CrossFit competition and a good blueprint to operate off of. Yeah. Also, given we've seen multiple, depending on your skill level, the how heavy a workout could be because you know the max lift might not be the only heavy workout we would see as well yeah definitely definitely i was just thinking too because I, I wrote a caveat uh sometimes you need to do the exact opposite ordering that i laid out where you you just you bunch it all up and you come up with a whole different combination and sequence of events and you challenge somebody like that. Usually though, that's going to be reserved for your higher level athletes. People that are going to possibly go into the games or the semifinals. So it's good principle to follow something similar to what I outlined here. But I mean, at the games, they're always doing the, or not always, but as of late, they've done the lifting event on Saturday night because that's when the most amount of people are there. That's also when they get there. ESPN coverage, I think. So those athletes have to be able to lift 11 events deep already. They're, you know, maximums, near maximums. So you have to, you know, you got to train that and be capable of, uh, of doing that. So you also want to make sure people are prepared for that and possibly are doing that when you are doing a simulation.
Anything on that? No, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, depending where your skill level is, like you said, you might need to do it in a way that's not best suited for you because it may not be that way. Um, meaning like the the approach and style to the events, you never know. In quarterfinals this year, they could only release two events at a time and say these are the two events you're getting, these are the ones you have to do these days and so forth, um, especially now that we have a longer – uh, competition period so i'm not sure how they'll structure it but it seems like we we likely will have more days or at least more hours to compete complete the workouts that are given because you know prior years it's two friday two saturday two sunday but now mm -hmm. they're released wednesday and we have until monday so um may give them room to release yeah release less but i don't think they will do that but there's still a possibility yeah, yeah, I, th I think I think it'll be six events. I think it'll be six events. It's always it's been five for the quarterfinals, but I think now they'll they'll I think they'll do six, or they might do like a one A one B, do a piece, and then you do something mm -hmm. else. Uh, let's talk about progressing these. So this is something I've actually changed my mind on a lot in the last I don't know two years. So previously, say two three say three years ago. I would, I would still do the most challenging simulation two weeks out from competition, which I still do. And I still think that's a good strategy for most people, but I would also have people do a couple simulations pre preceding that weekend in a row. So if, if two weeks out, you're doing your toughest three weeks out, you're doing another one, four weeks out, you're doing another one. And I did that for. I don't know, maybe, maybe two years. And if somebody was not as advanced or not as developed, they could handle it because they couldn't express as much intensity and they, they weren't digging as deep of a hole. And so they got, they could kind of get away with it. Whereas those that were really capable, it was, it was, it was draining on them a little bit too much because they were, they were able to push it a little bit or they held back unconsciously a little bit because their system just kind of knew like, I can't, I can't go for it. Cause I got to do it again next week. And then I got to do it again in two weeks. So I've changed that. And now I, I try to do, I try to do less simulations leading into competition than I did pr previously. Uh, so there are caveats where if somebody, it, somebody is going to benefit from more practice, sports specific practice of competition, then I might add in a few more. Uh, but most people right now, especially a lot of my higher level athletes are only going to do one good one next weekend, two weeks out from the competition. And that's it. They don't need to do, uh, they don't need to do any more than that. So, however, if somebody's not that advanced and maybe does need more practice then doing maybe two, and, and doing two with a week between them can be a very effective structuring. So you do, we do one, four weeks out and it's moderate. Maybe it's like a seven out of 10 difficulty. Then the next week's a training week. And then the next week's your really challenging one, which we could classify as like a nine out of 10. And then that's your, and then you get, a, you have like a, an easier week. And then the next week you compete. So that's kind of your four week for yeah four week preparation into competition so that can be a a nice setup uh for layer or structuring this the simulations and the training yeah yeah because even if the first one like you said it's easier i mean it can still be it doesn't have to be necessarily an event that they're doing or it doesn't have to look exactly like the competition weekend like you've done before um with myself or with other clients i'm sure and what i've done is basically you could just create training pieces where you can monitor the intensity or kind of gate it so they're not doing too much work or they're just touching on it so they can kind of feel it um or maybe they're doing one you know general training piece and then one event or it's kind of you know a give and take exactly oh it looks like you what you sent me just arrived yeah, just in nice. a, you know, what, like a, what a weekend could look like and, you know, 
Yes. And then you can kind of touch on maybe what, what maybe you could add some training or maybe this could be too much for somebody. Let's see. Share my screen. Uh, present. Careful. Share screen. <laughs> I think I got it. Share. Yes. Okay. Sweet. So we've got, this would be an example of a simulation you could do. Day one, event one, CrossFit total. Day two, or event two, day one, for time, 50 wall ball, 30 toes bar, 40 wall ball, 20 muscle up, 30 wall ball, 10 rope climb. And then, let's see. Yep. Day two, event three, eight minute AMRAP, 25 crossovers, 25 foot handstand walk. Event four, for time, 500 meter row, 50 GHGs, 100 meter row, 30 GHGs, 2000 meter row. Did I say 100 meter row? It was 1000 yeah, meter row. Yeah, that's an older. Uh, it's third. Yeah, it's an old crossfit cross workout. workout. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, and then 2000 meter row, 20 GHG sit ups. And then, why? Where's three? There it is. And then event five. 10 snatches, 185, 125, 15 burpee box jump overs, 10 clean jerks, 185, 125. Yeah, nice. Is this the is this similar to the one I gave you last year or is this a little different? Um, we did something similar to that, but it was a 40 cal row in between. Ah. Uh, um we've done some similar yeah. ones. Yeah. Okay. All of them are pretty similar to stuff we've done. Um, yeah, so but like, yeah, this could be just more. a this could be a three day example of what you could be working with. Day one, you warm up, you do the lifts because if you kind of control the schedule during quarterfinals, you might be able to do the lifts before, and you kind of want to do them fresh. The second mm -hmm. one could be a tougher workout, you know, that you have the time for. You do it. Maybe it's one you know you might need to repeat, so you you put it in early if it's due later. Um, and again, this isn't the actual competition day. So maybe when you're done, you might do some intervals after you might have another session. Uh, you might do a long flush, um, something like that, because you still are mimicking what you would do in the competition. So maybe your coach says like, hey, we're going to be doing a long flush here. You should have been doing that in training. We're going to do it now. And they have it plugged in for you. Day two, you have the eight minute AMRAP, you know, maybe you're doing some handstand practice. Maybe you're adding some pirouettes. Maybe you're doing something before. Um, you're practicing your crossovers, your crossover doubles. Uh, maybe you're doing some some more pressing since there's not that much in uh, in this weekend. So maybe you're doing some handstand push-ups or uh, you know something else. Then you go into the row. You do the row. This is a longer, tougher workout. So maybe you wouldn't do too much training after this, uh, or maybe you do some of the pressing work after that. And then on day three, you know, you're probably pretty tired, even though it's a, a simulation. But you're doing day three. Maybe you're warming up, you're doing some power snatches and clean and jerk work before the actual tough workout with those things, some type of CP prep. Um, and then maybe after you do some more, you do some more training, some cyclical work or something like that. So you can always add in extra training. It doesn't just have to be a strict, you know, simulation day or weekend, depending on what your, you know, what your goals are and where you are. Maybe the closer you get or the last simulation you're doing is going to mimic it very strictly and you're just doing warm up event, cool down. Um, and so on the entire weekend, I wrote something down. I was thinking about was when, when you're getting to this stage in training, you, you got You got to go in with the mentality that you're competing and you're, you're not, you're not doing the events to get a training response. You're doing the events to practice, like actually competing and getting ready for what that feels like. Cause it's so different. Like you're, you're approaching the workout or the event with the intention of how can I get the fastest time possible here? Or how can I get the best score? Or how can I lift the most load given where I'm at? And so that's a much different mentality than, okay, what's the stimulus I need from this piece and how am I going to maximize that? So I also see this as a great opportunity to start shifting your mentality towards competing and trying to get the best score possible or the maximum amount of repetitions possible or the maximum load possible versus getting a good training response. So that's, uh, that's very important with respect to the simulations and when you actually are doing them. Um, and also too, because when you are doing them, 
which is usually a few weeks out from competition, you're not, you're not, not a lot of things are changing with your fitness. The only thing that's really changing is your confidence. And ideally your confidence is growing. And this is one way in which you grow the confidence. So it's important to now start shifting your focus away from, well, how do I get better? It's like, well, you're not going to, you're not changing much right now. Like wherever you're at is where you're at. So now how do I maximize where I'm at so that when I go compete, I can express that as best as possible. So I think that's really important too, because then that allows you to let go of the fact that my fitness is where it is and I'm not going to change it between now and game day, but I can change my confidence. I can change my preparation. I can change my fueling strategy, which is, can be very, uh, uh, instrumental in your performance. Like there are things you can change and improve that can drastically, uh, influence your performance, but your, your fitness, your raw fitness, it, that's one of them. That's not going to happen. So mm -hmm. got to let that go. I will say though, an, an addendum to that statement in your training week, you do want to make sure you're getting enough reps in of certain movements. Roman and I actually talked about this uh, last week for our uh, compete program. Because what does happen when you do do simulations is usually the total volume of work in your week starts to come down because your intensity is going up quite a bit. So maybe previously, previous weeks you were doing 50, 60 ring muscle ups or muscle ups in general. And that was a very average amount of volume for the week. And then on simulation week, you're only doing 25 in a workout or an event, but those are very difficult 25. Maybe you're doing GC sit-ups and deadlifts and handstand walk before you do the muscle up. So the 25 feels very challenging. So you have to make sure that in your week, you're still getting enough repetitions in to ensure that your fitness level stays kind of where it needs to be. Because if you're, if you're losing... If you start pulling too much volume back, you can lose some fitness characteristics. You can actually go backwards a little bit. So you got to make sure that you are touching certain reps of certain movements in the week, which will vary because some people might need more pulling. Some people might need more pressing. Some people might need more squatting. So that can be unique to uh, who you are and your needs. And they don't have to be intense. Like you don't need to be doing thrusters in a Fran type format. You could just, you can do, you know, every two minutes. 10 toes to bar, 10 thrusters, 25 double unders. And then the next, every two minutes, you're doing something else, handstand pushups, power snatches and crossovers. And then you're just accumulating enough volume. Like maybe it's 50 reps of each. And then that's allowing you to make sure that you're maintaining adequate vault training volume for the week to maintain like fitness characteristics while you're sharpening everything on uh, simulation during simulation weekend. Yeah. Yeah. The confidence is a big one because I think people think like, well, I'm confident in my ability and I'm confident that I can do it, but it's different than there's an element to it. Like how many times this year have you sat behind a taped line and then like 10, five, you know, 10, nine, eight, all the way down three, two, one. And then you had to like run to the bar or run to the movement, or there's just so many different things you have to do that you haven't practiced that, that you may not think that's like throwing off my confidence, but it, it's just something so different that you're not normally doing that it's something you need to go do. Um, so putting that into practice, you can do that. You don't even have to do that into a simulation, but it's the little things like that, that I think will uh, go a long way in the confidence portion. And then also, like you said, you're, you're adding more reps and doing other things throughout the week and you're still training, but you can kind of shift the training to that as well. It's like, you know, every time you're doing the chest bar, you're extra pulling and you're pressing, like, you know, set things up a little farther away and kind of just practice that transition. And, you know, uh, you can kind of make it a whole simulation period in terms of like, I'm practicing these little things to, to become confident at, at them. Not like I'm getting more confident at chest bar, but just the way you're approaching it and the way that you're doing it in a workout. I have a good story. This was 2019. And a client at the time, Christine, if she, if she's hearing this, I'm, I'm sure she'll, she'll laugh a little. Uh, so we go to, I think it was the Mac. I think it was the Mac. It was a, it was a sanctional. Well, at the time it was in Washington DC this year, that year. Oh, okay. And she qualified for the games for the open, but we wanted to do that, that event as like a, a primer or just give her, 
exposure to competing ahead of the big dance. So that was one of my first, and it wasn't my first, but one of my first few like bigger competitions to go with an athlete to. And I remember showing up and, you know, how are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And then we, we go over to the warm up area and, uh, she's like, Oh, I forgot my weightlifting belt. I'm like, you have your weightlifting belt? She's like, yeah, I, I forgot. it. I was like, Oh man, well, that's kind of a problem. We need that. And she's like, and I, and then I'm looking around and I'm like, do you have a water bottle? She's like, no, I don't have a water bottle. I'm like, you don't have any water. She's like, no, I don't have any water. I'm like, Oh my gosh. So I go get her some water and, and she went to, uh, I think it was Tupu. They had a booth. And so she went to the booth and, and was going to go buy a belt and they gave her one. So we got that taken care of. And then after the event, she didn't have any food or anything. And she had like a 30 minute trek to get to her place. And so I like gave her some stuff I had. Um, it was just, it was, it was, it was funny. And I'm laughing because it she was so unprepared and part of it was my fault. Cause I didn't, I didn't like go over this with her beforehand. Uh, so it was a really good learning for both of us that were like, okay, there was a lot of good takeaways from this, like having our equipment, making sure we have food, making sure we have water, uh, getting there on time, like at the same time together, like, cause there was some, like she was late one day and then we, we got, so there's just a lot of good learning. And part of this could have been mitigated through the simulations that we, that we did beforehand where I obviously didn't do a good job as a coach communicating. Like, these are the things I want you to be paying attention to and keeping an eye on. And, you know, after that she's competed at the games and many high level competitions and she's done a great job and very professional. So she learned from it, but it was just a great eye opening for me as a coach around. Okay. There are these little things that you can't necessarily take for granted, even if you are at that level or, you know, you've qualified like, there's just things you don't think about. And the same with golf too. Like for me, you, you, you could easily just pick out the differences between those that were the best versus those that were more mediocre. It's probably same with swimming. There's just these little things that you just don't think about when you, when you do go compete that make a huge difference. So you do want to see the simulations as an opportunity, just, you know, not to beat a dead horse to just really refine and tighten and dial in all these things. So it's just very seamless when game day comes and you just, you just, you just have this little sense of peace. Like I don't have to worry about a lot of things. So it's my little, uh, my little story. That was so funny. We were both cracking up afterwards. It's yeah, great. Want to learn. There's a, yeah. yeah, little stuff you don't think about or you're, it's not even that, uh, you're necessarily not thinking about it. You just, you know, you have so much going on. There's a lot to think about in general and you're focused on competing so um it's just easy for little things to to get lost and, and not remember get a little hey sherry question from sherry okay how different do you think quarterfinals will be for age groups this year since any age groups will likely be doing the same work this year on the same weekend and we'll change how we prepare i think i think they'll be fairly similar but the just the loading and maybe some of the movements like will be scaled down or change, but I, I, I doubt I, I I'm assuming they're going to have the same set of tests just because that makes it easier on them. Uh, they don't have to make a whole nother set of tests. I could be wrong, but that would be my guess. Yeah. I don't see it being too different. I was wondering if they would uh, make weight adjustments for, you know, earlier age groups or rep adjustments since they kind of start at 55, but I'm, I'm not counting on that. And I think, uh, yeah, I think from what they've hinted at, it almost seems like, like we've said it before and things will just maybe be gated in a way like there's a ladder or, you know, like an increasing weight and increasing load and increasing effort or rep scheme, something like that. But who knows? Well, CrossFit could do one. Okay. Interesting. Well, here, Roman, you can answer this question better than I could measuring <laughs> less stressful uh you want to practice it before um 
and leading up, like I'm t- and starting in January, I'm taping lines for for like shuttles and my handstand push. Oh my, I do that kind of year round, but like I'm definitely setting up things how I would normally do it in quarterfinals. Um, I'll just film something, even if I'm just deleting it later. I'll set up the camera, and it kind of helps uh, people around you if you're doing it in a gym, kind of understand and see it more, and they're not like nervous around it or they know you're filming. Um, the open is a great time for that, but as hard as it is, you do, it, it helps with extra people. Like it helps with someone being close to the video camera and it helps with somebody, uh, being there to judge or to make sure. And these people are, you know, they need to be somewhat knowledgeable. That helps me the most. I usually have another client or, um, uh, or a friend or a, and my, and or my wife there. So that helps me. Um, if you're not in that situation, you know, I would definitely have a judge and just have two phones, but um, when the, the, we usually get the tape, like the, uh, not the tape lines, the uh, floor plans early, just, you need to look at them. And like, you know, I'm lucky I have a pretty good sized gym that I train out of. So um, space usually isn't an issue, but even with my big gym, it's always an issue of knowing where equipment needs to be and what angle I need to do to see a clock. So you just need to study those floor plans, really get a good idea on how and where it's going to be set up. Um, and then I just get, to, we get to the gym early and we tape everything, whatever workout we're doing that day, if I'm doing two or three, we tape every single one before we're even getting warmed up. Um, so it's just there and ready to go. So have people to help. If there's no people there, have two phones, have an extra camera, have someone there to judge you, um, and then get everything prepped and taped before you even start. That's yeah, my, that's a uh, good one. Taping and everything, getting everything set before you even warm up. Last yeah. thing you want to do is like, okay, I'm ready to go. All right, well, let's tape everything. And then 10 minutes mm-hmm. later, oh, now I feel cool. It's like, yeah, don't do yeah, that. Yeah, we have a couple of tape measures and we'll lay them out. Like if it's on the floor, we'll have it ready sitting there. We'll have another one ready sitting next to the handstand push up and another one next to the rope or whatever it is. So we don't, we're not in fooling with them. We're just videoing it, filming it, going. Um, that helps a lot too. No bad videos. So yeah, the, those are simulations. Well, yeah, I, what we need to, to think... do is maybe si- simulate this podcast a few more times. So we don't yeah. Have any uh, technical errors? People yeah, on speak Spotify, for yourself. They're not. Yeah. People on Spotify, um, they'll be confused. So if you're this far in on Spotify, we had some technical malfunctions. I'm on my iPhone now but it's working any yeah any closing thoughts or pieces you think we missed or glossed yeah, over or any cool. any questions from anyone yeah if you have any questions from up but um train some training considerations i would say is you know if you're a coach out there or if you're an athlete and you kind of know where you are you can shift a lot of this stuff like i mean if you know you have a full-time job or you're in school and you know, on quarterfinals weekends, you're going to have X, Y, and Z come up. This is the time to adjust those now and to make the, you know, to simulate it. You want to mimic what it's going to be like then. Um, If this is like your first quarterfinals and, you know, you don't like, you know, maybe you're nervous or maybe you're, you know, maybe you're in that 10 to 15% mark, you're going to still do quarterfinals, then, um, you know, you're just trying to mimic what it's going to be like. So you don't necessarily need to just go full on and do all these events and styles. Uh, style events that are like for time, super hard, super heavy. Maybe you're just doing something similar to understand it. Um, and if and if it's really hard for you, then possibly maybe you just don't do quarterfinals and it's maybe not time for you to do that yet. Um, fueling, you want to practice some fueling. You don't want to change a lot up. I don't, I don't know if you touched on that, but like uh, when, I, when I was absent, but you don't want to change a lot up, but you may need to be eating more during this time or you may need to be you know, maybe you're doing a few more snacks and maybe you're not used to like, you know, doing two really hard events back to back, or maybe this is again, your first or second quarterfinals. You haven't done a lot of competitions, you know, practicing little things like that. But um, yeah, I think just with that and, and timing and understand, like, you, you know, be conscious of like what time it is, how long you're resting between the events, you know, maybe you rested 90 minutes and you didn't know, and now you're under fueled or you didn't eat enough and little things like that. You just have to be conscious of what you're doing in the simulation because you want to be, it's like studying for the test. You want to be well prepared when you get to a quarterfinal. So, you know, like, Hey, I just finished this workout. It's two o'clock. 
the next one's due at X time. Like I know I need to start by three. So I need to start warming up at, you know, whatever it is and things like that. Yeah. The fuel. Yeah. Don't want to change too much. Yeah, you're right. With the fueling, you also just want to make sure you're not. Yeah. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, like running on empty. Cause yeah, if you're, if you're low on glycogen, that can really impact your performance in your just energy output. Like your body just, you, you know, you won't get above third gear, which can be very costly. So it's definitely something to pay attention to and, and play with a little bit in simulations and also your just training in general. So that on game day, you just have a better sense of like, do I need to be drinking Gatorade between events? Like a whole bottle? Maybe that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's not nothing wrong with that. Uh, especially if you're going to do multiple events. Cause if you are going to do multiple events in the same day and you haven't been training doubles all year where your system's used to that, you're going to need some sort of fuel between events, biasing heavily carbohydrates. Uh, so the transit time through your system is faster and usually simple carbs like Gatorade or a, a carb powder that your gut can handle. So you could play with that, uh, when you're doing your simulations. One thing I wrote down, because you mentioned training considerations that I, I forgot to mention was when, you, when you're outlining the week, the simulation is going to be more intense than normal because you're giving a more intensive or a more elevated level of effort. So usually the rest of the training week, you're, you're bringing the intensity down a little bit. You're not keeping it up across the whole week. It's just too much. So if it's simulation week and let's say you're doing your simulation on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Monday, Tuesday, are your training days outside of the simulation days, then, then or not, sorry, not, uh, not Monday. Yeah. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday rest. Then Monday, Tuesday would be lower days is how I would think of it. So intensity is down a little bit. Maybe the total volume is a little bit less. It should feel the person person should feel leaving those sessions good. They got good training in. They're not too tired. They're not too fatigued. They're not too achy. Uh, there's no excessive local fatigue. So that when you go into the simulation, you, you feel good and prepared. And then the following week, those next few days of Monday and Tuesday are also kind of low or more moderate. So that's just one thing to be thinking of because if, if you're elevating intensity for a, a finite period of time, the, the ends that, the, the training that precedes it and proceeds it need to be adjusted accordingly for that. Otherwise people will just get tired or a little bit uh, worn down also gives you insight too, on how well they handle intensity. So if they're just really beat up from the simulation, then they just, they're probably not ready for it. They don't have enough volume built. Uh, so just something to keep in mind with, uh, when you lay out the training for people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sounds common sense but you can run yourself into the ground during this time period and, oh yeah uh, you can't overtrain or i'll say you you can do too much thinking that this is the time to buckle down but if you should have been buckled down a long time ago now you're refining and you're attempting to feel for as fresh as possible and feel like we talked about confident yeah yeah that's that's a really really good point if anything you you're starting to do like less and less and less and less, and then you compete. You shouldn't be doing more and more and more. You're, the, the volume you're doing is starting to manipulate into more intensive, more replicating what you actually have to do on competition day, but you're not, you're not adding these large swaths of volume. Like you're not now doing 200 toes to bar in the week when you've been doing you know, maybe 50. Like you, that's just not what you do. You do the 200 like seven months ago and you got to, you know, you start big, lots of volume, and then you're going to move it into more intensive scenarios, replicating the support and allowing you to really express and challenge that movement in a context that's indicative of what you got to do on game day. So yeah, you're not, you're not adding a bunch more right now. So don't yeah. do that. Yep. Oh, seems good. like a rat. I think yeah, it's uh, good. If, uh, if you're looking for a condensed version, we'll have a YouTube video coming out on the main points we chatted about, uh, the example weekend, how you can go and attack it. 
um, there won't be any mishaps or technical difficulties. So um, if you've already left, then you'll have a quick summary of it. Perfect. Can't wait to watch it. You'll have to hit end live this time. Thanks, everyone, for I watching. Know. Yeah, thanks, everyone.